who was Pavel Florinsky? Now, this is the question we will be looking at in this introductory video on this great Russian Orthodox thinker. He was born in 1882, died in 1937. It was a sort of a Renaissance man, a polymath. He was a brilliant mathematician, historian, philosopher, and he prefigured in his concepts and his ideas a lot of Heideggerian notions, which I find fascinating and intriguing. And I've been reading through this book, The Pillar and the Ground of Truth, um, which is available in PDF form for free. It's a quite, a, I think, on the more expensive side in terms of purchasing the hard copy. But I wanted to do this video introducing uh, this, this wonderful thinker and maybe reading through some of his um, some of the chapters here. It's, it's broken down into 12 letters. Um, let me see if I can take you guys here with me. Um, we'll look at the table of content, contents. This was published in 1997, I believe, um, by Princeton Press. And it's comprised of two sections. The first section is uh, this, the pillar and the ground of the truth which is um, first section is this note to the reader. And then these 12 letters, uh, which go over these topics, two worlds, uh, doubt. And that's the one that I want to read from that I've read through thoroughly. Uh, Try unity does a lot of work on the Trinity and its relation to identity. And uh, even in psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic sense of identity, um, he talks about the light of the truth. Uh, letter five is the comforter. Letter six, contradiction. Letter seven is on sin. Letter eight is on Guiana. Letter nine is on creation. Letter 10 on Sophia. Letter 11 on friendship. And letter 12 on jealousy. And there's an afterword. And the second section of the book is a clarification and proof of certain particulars assumed in the text um, to be already proved. So certain concepts from the theory of infinity. Um, a problem of Lewis Carroll and the question of dogma, irrationalities in mathematics and dogma the concept of identity in scholastic philosophy, the concept of identity in mathematical logic, the heart and its significance in the spiritual life of man, according to scripture, an icon of the Annunciation with cosmic symbolism on the methodology of the historical critique, the turquoise event environment of Sophia and the symbolism of sky blue and dark blue, Pascal's amulet on the history of the term antinomy, aesthetics and religion, homotypy and the structure of the human body, remarks on Trinity, and the basic symbols of elementary formulas of symbolic logic for reference. Uh, remember, he is he was a brilliant um, mathematician at, at kind of a very high level. He was published as well, um, was uh, actually uh, writing at the time of the um, Bolshevik Revolution, was actually imprisoned twice, and uh, was martyred um, for, his, for his views. So we're going to read through some parts of the introduction here to get an idea of the milieu that uh, he was coming up in and an idea of who this, this, this um, the wonderful life of this wonderful Russian, Russian Orthodox thinker, uh, that I think his concepts, his ideas, his work is going to be, um, is, is still to come in the sense of its impact and its importance. So let's go introduction to translation is from the translator, um, introduction to the translation by Richard F. Gustafson. So you can read along here with me. Uh, so Russian religious thought is a unique modern expression of the Eastern Christian worldview. It came of age early in the 20th century in a period now referred to as the Russian religious renaissance and is known to the West, mainly in the works of Nikolai Bergiev, Leon Shestov. The roots of the modern Russian religious philosophy can be traced to the nationalist debates about Russia and its world historical cultural mission in the mid 19th century. The Westernizers following the lead of Peter the Great argued that Russia's future lay in an alliance with the West. They were challenged by the Slavophiles who claimed that Russia's unique social and religious experience not only shaped its past, but destined its future. Uh, these are uh, rather relevant questions for today, I would think so. Um, so one of the early prominent Slavophile thinkers, Ivan Kirivsky called for the creation of a modern Russian philosophy, which would use, which would use as a convenient point of departure the then fashionable German idealist philosophy of Schelling and Hegel, but corrected by the quote basic principles of ancient Russian culture. Vladimir Solvoy took up Kirivsky's directive, his philosophy of quote unquote total unity 
and its theology of God-manhood are the culmination of this 19th century Russian philosophical endeavor and the intellectual foundation on which the religious renaissance rested. As with Solvoy, this return to religious roots was a decided reaction against the prevailing positivism of the times and, for some, a movement from Marxism to idealism. But this idealism tended to lose sight of Kirvitsky's basic principles of ancient Russian culture. Father Pavel Florensky, who is the uh, author of this book and whose we will be um, talking about, was born again in 1882, died in 1937, uh, regrounded the philosophical endeavor on the basic principles and his unique book, The Pillar and Ground of Truth, uh, became a seminal work for the new Russian Orthodox philosophy. So Lorensky, who is he? He was a polymath and a Renaissance man, was born in Azerbaijan and lived most of his early days in Tbilisi, Georgia. He claimed that the mountains, he claimed that the mountainous trans-Caucasian environment shaped his way of thinking. His mother was a Mar Armenian and his father Russian. From his mother's line, he believed he inherited the, his artistic tendencies, while his, from, from his father, he railroad, he believed he inherited his, uh, it was his father, who was a railroad engineer, descended from the clergy, both his scientific and religious interests. In later years, he imagined his childhood days as an Edenic, Edenic paradise, now lost, and asserted that the child has absolutely precise metaphysical formulas of everything otherworldly, and the sharper his sense of Edenic life, the more defined is his knowledge of these formulations, of these formulas. His memoirs record many moments of his, quote, direct contemplation of nature's countenance when he felt himself, quote, face to face with the naive, solitary, mysterious, and infinite eternity from which everything flows and to which everything returns. These childhood moments of, quote, ecstasy their sense of, quote, magic gave him, quote, an objective, non-centripetal perception of the world, a kind of inverse perceptive perspective, which allowed for a, quote, penetration into the depth of things. In school, however, Pavel turned from his childhood mysticism towards the sciences and their laws, a scholarly interest that he maintained throughout his life. Quote, the mystery I kept within myself the laws were proclaimed for myself and others. The decisive moment came in the summer of 1899 when Florensky reread in a home without religion, or reared, sorry, in a home without religion, had a metaphysical dream of existential darkness and meaninglessness through which he heard and saw the name of God. When he later heard, when later he heard the voice call out his name, he became convinced of the ontologicalness of the spiritual world. Florensky's adult life was shaped by his dichotomous lore of mystical intuition and the laws of science. In the fall of, 1989, or 1899, he entered Moscow University, where he studied mathematics with the noted mathematician N. V. Bugiev and philosophy with S. N. Trubetsky and L. M. Lopetan. Sorry about these pronunciations. In 1904, he rejected a research fellowship for advanced work in mathematics to enroll in the Moscow Theological Academy. And in 1911, he was ordained to the priesthood. This text, The Pillar and the Ground of the Truth, grew out of his candidate's thesis on religious truth and his master's dissertation on spiritual truth. Upon graduation, Florensky joined the faculty where he taught until he, the closing of the academy after the revolution. In these years, he also served as editor of the important Bogzolvsky Vestnik Theological Herald and wrote numerous articles on mathematics and the philosophy of language, as well as theology, some of which remained unpublished. After the revolution, Florensky redirected his scholarly activity. He developed his interest in art history, wrote a book on the analysis of space and art, and a seminal study on icons, and taught the theory of perspective at the State Higher Technical Artistic Studios. He also pursued research in physics and electrical engineering, worked for the Commission of, for the Electrification of Soviet Russia, and served as an editor for the Soviet Technical Encyclopedia, to which he contributed many articles. 1927, he invented a non-coagulation machine oil, which the Soviets called Dekanite, Dekanite in commemoration of the Bolshevik Revolution. His book on dielectri dielectrics became a standard textbook. 
Throughout this period, he remained a priest and appeared at government offices in his cassock. Arrested briefly in 1928, Florensky managed to pursue his childhood, his, his scholarly activities until 1933, when the Soviet government sentenced him to 10 years of corrective labor in Siberia. At various camps, he continued his scientific work and ministered to his fellow prisoners. On August 8, 1937, he was executed. Florensky was rehabilitated in 1956 and then was slowly rediscovered, first mainly as a philosopher of language and culture of interest to Soviet semiotics. In post-communist Russia, he has reemerged as a seminal philosopher and theologian and become a major symbolic figure in the Back to Roots movement. Florensky must be seen, first of all, however, as a man of his era. He arrived in Moscow in 1899 at age 17, in time to experience the growth and flowering of Russian symbolism. He befriended Andrei Beli, the son of his mathematics professor, N. V. Bogiev and Vashilev Ivanov, a distinguished classic scholar, both of whom were important symbolists, poets, and theoreticians. Lorensky's first published review was of Belli's Northern Symphonies, of Bilan's uh, Northern Symphonies, and Florensky himself published poems in the symbolist journal Vesi, The Scales. In his memories, he claimed retrospectively, I have always been a symbolist. Russian symbolism, in, with its renewed concern with the significance of language and classical and med medieval culture, its focus on intuitive knowledge and its mystical apprehension of the divine root of reality, couched in the language of Vladimir Solovoy's, Solovoy, was seemingly made for Florensky, and his philosophical and theological work must be seen in light of this important movement. With the symbolist, Florensky shares, quote, a conception of the world and culture as a composition of symbols turned both upward toward its original homeland and meaning and downward towards the fate of man in history. Florensky's fundamental conception of the truth is constructed according to the symbolist model of reality where all phenomena are reflections, emanations, or manifestations of the nomena, of the nomena, and we are to move in Vasiliev Avanov's programmatic phrase, the Rilabas ad Riolaria, Florensky's ornate metaphorical and lyrical writing style, which Berdyev dismissed as, quote, stylized archaism and decadent Alexandrianism, is characteristic of much symbolist, uh, symbolist procedure. The pillar and ground of the truth, which was conceived and written at the height of the movement, represents in style, structure, and worldview the most elaborated work of Russian symbolist theology. The pillar and the ground of the truth is constructed not as a philosophical treatise, but as a series of 12 letters addressed to an unidentified brother, friend, elder, and guardian who may be understood symbolically as Christ. Poetic moments describing the narrator's present sense of separation from this, quote, far yet eternally near friend are sprinkled throughout the text, thus identifying the narrator's spiritual mood which is his constant awareness of the quote unquote two worlds and his desire to reach out from this world to experience or touch the other world. Argument often yields to emotion and logic to lyricism. The basic assumption is that quote, the philosophical creation of truth is closest to artistic creation. The narrator's I is not an abstract, colorless, impersonal consciousness in general. Florensky insisted at the defense of his master's dissertation, but, quote, concretely general, symbolically personal, a, quote, methodological I in dialogue with its addressee. This is the idea that really turned me on to Florensky, uh, full stop. Uh, the method is, quote, dialectical understood as an, quote, ever-growing ball of threads of contemplation, a clot of penetrations, ever congealing, ever introducing, ever intruding into the essence of the subject studied, an aggregate of the processes of thought, which mutually reinforce and justify each other. Furthermore, the dialectical development of this concrete living narrator's thought cannot be linear or, quote, presented in a, as a single voiced melody of discoveries, but it resembles more a, quote, fabric or lace whose threads are woven into varied and complex patterns. Such a book, like any typical modernist text, cannot be read, but only reread. 
In characteristic, symbolist fashion, Florensky stressed the aesthetic character of his own book. He carefully chose the illustrations, created a special typeface for it, and oversaw its production. Quote, a book as a whole must 